Hello students, welcome to my lecture on terrorism. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, counter-terrorism, that is uh, how to combat, how to fight this global menace which has uh, tormented the world for the last over three decades. In fact, uh, terrorism is a baffling phenomenon and the international community, uh, frankly speaking, is at a loss. And as you can see from uh, the developments that have taken place in recent times, that in spite of uh, numerous uh, discussions, negotiations, and of course uh, conventions that have been adopted uh, at the international level, and also um, talk of uh, cooperation among the states, uh, it has not been possible to stop the onslaught of terrorism, which is quite clear from the recent attacks uh, that have been continuing. In fact, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, a number of counter uh, measures have been adopted by states, particularly by the affected states. But in the process, you know, it has provoked retaliatory terrorism. For instance, uh, you know, I mean, one of the uh, measures that have been adopted actually in recent times, particularly by the Western states, is uh, to uh, attack uh, terrorist uh, targets, terrorist positions uh, in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Syria, uh, by uh, air attacks. But uh, the fact remains that, you know, I mean, so far they have not been as useful as has been anticipated. On the contrary, in fact, these uh, attacks, these attacks, uh, air attacks actually have uh, uh, provoked uh, further uh, retaliatory action by the terrorists. And so this, um, you know, I mean, this vicious cycle actually goes on that, that uh, the, the more attacks that the terrorists carry out, the uh, more, in fact, is uh, counter measures by the, the affected states. And these measures again provoke uh, re retaliatory action on the part of the affected states. And uh, so therefore, the attempts of the states to wipe out the terrorists by all possible coercive, coercive measures, that is, uh, you know, measures of, that is force, application of force. Uh, unfortunately, actually, that has not been uh, successful. In fact, uh, the problem is, you know, that there is a uh, very important psychological element in this. And uh, if there is no countermeasure, you know, following a terrorist attack, then there is a fear that, uh, you know, I mean, that... Um, you know, I mean, it might be seen as a weakness on the part of the victim states. So, therefore, they are goaded into taking uh, coercive me measures, uh, you know, instead of political negotiations. So, I think, you know, we find ourselves in a kind of stalemate. And the killings of innocents uh, on the part of the terrorists, on the one hand, goes on. And on the other hand, of course, you know, the countermeasures like um, custody dates, fake encounter, and untraced victims, uh, these also continue. In fact, uh, states have often tried to follow what is generally known as a carrot and stick policy. I mean, that simply means that, uh, you know, I mean, on the one hand, uh, concessions, nego negotiations, uh, on the other hand, coercive measures like the ones that I have mentioned. However, so far, there has been no long-term result. Now, terrorists actually are globally linked, as we have seen earlier. You know, I mean, they are operate, they operate, do not operate necessarily from one country, but they are operating globally, you know, particularly across the three continents of Asia, Europe and Africa.
but you see the states uh, frankly speaking in spite of a lot of negotiations and lot of uh, uh, discussions they have not really been able to act in unison that is um, together now for instance i think let me give you an example the us war on terror uh, you know which the us uh, followed actually following the 911 attacks uh, was not uh, universally accepted by all states you know i mean so frankly speaking we have a divided world that is uh, there is no unanimity as to how these this particular menace should be should be tackled in fact uh, on the one hand of course you know i mean there are the advocates of coercive and military solution who argue that this particular menace can only be solved by the application of force and particularly military force on the other hand you know there is uh, an opinion there is a strong opinion that uh, what is necessary is to address the root causes uh, now what are these root causes actually this is something that i will return to a little later now i have already referred to numerous conventions that had been that have been ad, uh, adopted particularly before 911 now uh, these uh, conventions are too numerous to be recounted here but i can give you some uh, specific uh, examples of what the united nations has tried to do because the united nations has been quite uh, active in this regard now for instance you know one can take uh, you know i mean i will have to in fact refer to uh, these conventions I mean the un conventions i mean in some detail uh, to be able to make the matter clear to you and uh, so therefore i will have to read out portions of these conventions uh, for your benefit for instance in 1994 the united nations general assembly adopted a resolution condemning all forms of terrorism and states were advised to refrain from organizing instigating facilitating financing encouraging or tolerating terrorist activities of any kind in their territories now this was reiterated that is uh, again repeated by the un millennium summit which was held in 2000 and uh, the millennium summit actually set some goals for the world community like, you know like eradicating uh, poverty and illiteracy and so on and so forth i mean but these apart from that of course you know i mean on terrorism also it adopted uh, the same declaration that were that had been adopted in 1994 now after 9, uh, 9/11 that is the terrorist attacks on america in september uh, 2001 um, the security council adopted a resolution number 1373 on 28 september 2001 now this particular uh, resolution was very significant because it came immediately after that horrible attack and the world community was shocked and so therefore uh, the impact was uh, very severe and um, in fact this particular uh, resolution imposed several obligations on member states now these uh, obligations actually included efforts uh, to uh, suppress finance in fact this particular resolution actually uh, laid a lot of emphasis on uh cutting out the financing of terrorist activities because after all you know terrorists actually you know they need uh, funds funds to carry out their their activities this these are costly uh, ventures and so therefore where do they get their money from obviously you know this was this 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 became actually a a, a major target so therefore obviously there was an attempt to suppress uh, finance of terrorist acts to criminalize the willful provision or collection by any means of funds by their nationals or in their territories to freeze without delay funds financial assets 
and economic resources of persons committing or participating in the commission or facilitating commission of terrorist acts. Now, what in simple English, what this means actually is that the Security Council was imposing obligations on the states that they should do whatever they could in their power to ensure that there was no uh, uh, effort on the part of any individual or any group to collect funds um, within their territories um, which might ostensibly um, lead to financing of terrorist acts either within their territory or in any other country. This is plain and simple what Resolution 1373 actually implied or meant. Apart from that, of course, you know, there were other obligations also which were uh, imposed on the states, namely surveillance and information exchange with regard to suspected agents, quiet diplomacy to reach a common ground of understanding on needs of collaboration through informal channels. That is, in other words, uh, it was realized by the world community after the 9-11 attacks that it, there was a need for concerted action, that it was a global problem and so therefore it needed a global solution. And in order to reach a global solution, what was necessary was that the states should really cooperate uh, and coordinate with each other with um, greater degree than what had been uh, witnessed so far. Now, so therefore, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, Inter the United Nations Security Council imposed these obligations to coordinate and cooperate. I mean, this is what basically it means. Then I pass on to uh, the regional efforts, you know, I mean, apart from the United Nations, you know, I mean, the world has a, a number of regional organizations about whom you must be aware of. Um, and particularly, I'm referring to the Arab League, the Organization of Islamic Conference, then uh, the European Union, uh, the Organization of American States, the Organization of African Unity, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, just to name a few. Now, all these regional groupings actually have, in the last particularly 20 years, 20-25 years, have adopted some kind of uh, convention or other uh, related to terrorism. And basically, these conventions actually, you know, I mean, I'm not uh, going into the details of these conventions because they are too technical and too legal. But basically, what they really amount to is, again, what I have mentioned in connection with the Security Council resolution, that is to um, impose on their, or rather request, I mean, if impo imposition is not possible, to request their members, member states, that they should, in fact, do everything in their power to ensure uh, surveillance, uh, to, in fact, uh, strengthen intelligence, uh, to exchange uh, intelligence, uh, to um, like cut off uh, the sources of financing, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, these are the basic issues, actually, which most of these conventions uh, deal with. However, they have so far not been very effective. You know, why? Because, uh, you know, main problem is that so far, a, a very comprehensive international convention has not been uh, adopted, it has not been possible to be adopted due to lack of unanimity. The main problem is, as I have mentioned earlier, is the issue of definition, that how do you define an act of terrorism? Of course, you know, I mean, there is a general consensus that uh, an act of terrorism actually is a violent act aimed at uh, uh, specific targets, sometimes innocent people, uh, men, women, and children, to achieve a political objective, political or social or cultural or religious objective.
but the main question is that uh, who is a terrorist? I mean, that is the problem. I mean, uh, as I said in, 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 in an earlier lecture, that uh, one man's uh, terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So therefore, the states actually, you know, I mean, it is a, it is a problem of interpretation that uh, not everybody agrees uh, that a particular group is a terrorist group or is acting in a terrorist manner. So definition is the real problem. So therefore, uh, there has been a, a lack of meaningful and actionable coordination. That is coordination, uh, you know, on the basis of which action can be taken uh, among the states, particularly the state law enforcing agencies. And there have been numerous instances, you know, particularly in the uh, rec recent, uh, particularly in the March 2016 Brussels attack case, that uh, the police in uh, Belgium actually had been given intelligence about a possible attack but there was an internal problem within uh, Belgium, uh, particularly the intelligence agencies and the police force in Brussels, and so therefore uh, timely action could not be taken. So that, and apart from that, of course, there is the menace of suicide terrorism. How do you stop a man who is hell bent uh, to kill himself and, in the process, you know, kill other innocent people? So therefore, you know, terrorism today actually is an invisible force. You don't really see it. So far, humanity, you know, I mean, the, in the history of warfare, what we have seen actually is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, clear case that where you can see your enemy. You know, I mean, when you see, when you can see your enemy, now you are able to actually fight him. You know how to, how to target him. But when you do not see your enemy, you know, and he strikes actually from almost nowhere. Uh, how do you fight him? I think this is this is the the crux of the problem. So, what are the solutions? I mean, do we have to conclude that uh, there are no solutions? Of course, you know. I mean, I have already said that you know there are two kinds of uh, opinions. One is that you know that only military force is the solution. The other. Uh, argument is that no, uh, you have to go into the root causes. And the root causes actually uh, can be traced to the injustices perpetrated, uh, particularly during the colonial era, uh, which uh, I have referred to earlier. In fact, uh, there are cases uh, like Palestine, where uh, the Palestinian people are still without a state and they are suffering all kinds of injustices. In fact, Many of the present problems originating from the Middle East actually relate to Palestine or the um, unresolved uh, issue of Palestine. And, and of course, you know, I mean, there is a, there has been, after the colonial era was over, in fact, the successor regimes were either unable or unwilling to deal with the, the root grievances, uh, which actually led to this kind of injustices. And, and these injustices are felt by groups communities or segments of a civil society on account of their perception of marginalization, uh, deprivation and victimization. You know, they feel that they are not getting justice. And so therefore, uh, sometimes actually, you know, I mean, uh, when they reach the end of the road, I mean, they are uh, almost compelled to resort to violence of some kind or the other. Now, when this violence takes place, what is the response of the regime? The regime actually takes, uh, uh, gives, uh, res uh, or takes resort to three kinds of responses, uh, either repression or inducement. Inducement means actually, I mean, giving some sort of concession, some sort of, uh, um, um, you know, some sort of, um, some sort of uh, measures actually which uh, satisfy them in some way or the other. And um, finally, of course, um, you know, accommodation, that is, in other words, acceptance of uh, their grievances. Uh, however, uh, these have not been always very uh, successful.
In fact, uh, the issue of ethnicity is also an important one, apart from religious fundamentalism, which I have discussed uh, very extensively. You know, there are ethnic groups in uh, many countries, actually, who feel that they are marginalized and they are uh, deprived, and uh, particularly in the post-Cold War period. You know, and, and what happens is that, you know, I mean, during the Cold War period, of course, you know, these ethnic groups uh, were not able to assert themselves or their identity or their grievances in the manner, for instance, that uh, they have been able to in the post-Cold War era because the post-Cold War era actually has been a more open era, actually, you know, the straight jacket of uh, bipolar world actually uh, had come to an end and uh, the world has become multipolar, uh, globalization has taken place, so there is a more uh, open atmosphere, more free atmosphere, and so, therefore, uh, you know, I mean, you find that these ethnic groups are able to assert themselves much more than they had been doing actually during the, or they were unable to do actually during the Cold War period. And so, therefore, this has led to an escalation in violence and uh, separatist trends, uh, giving rise to adoption of terror tactics. Now, I've already referred to globalization uh, many times. And uh, globalization actually uh, has, uh, in fact, contributed to a feeling of insecurity in the developing world, uh, particularly the aggressive brand of market uh, fundamentalism uh, pursued by the developed uh, countries or particularly the developed West. You know, the way the markets of the developing countries are being forced open in fact, I mean, that uh, has created uh, its own kind of uh, insecurity. And uh, there has been a gradual realization of, uh, of this uh, insecurity in the developing world, increasing realization in the West, uh, and particularly in the liberal circles in the West. So what is the way out? I mean, that is the, 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 the ultimate question. I mean... Of course, we have agreed, and I have uh, mentioned this uh, several times, that uh, terrorism is a complex phenomenon, that it is an invisible force, and so therefore uh, it, is, it, has, it is really baffling. I mean, to be very frank, the world community is at a loss as to what to do with it and how to bring it to an end. In fact, uh, there is a tendency in some circles to reduce it to simplicity. That, uh, in other words, uh, you know, that is the military view, that uh, there can only be a military solution to, to this problem. But that is not so easy. It is not simply a law and order uh, or Afghanistan-style uh, solution. Uh, it has already been proved without uh, any, beyond any, any, any doubt that uh, the uh, Iraq action, the war on terror actually has been a failure, uh, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And uh, this type of solution is not possible. So what is needed actually is to deal with, uh, of course, you know, I mean, uh, criminal activities have to be dealt with law as per law. Uh, but at the same time, greater understanding has to be shown to the root causes. I've already mentioned uh, some of the root causes, marginaliz marginalization, deprivation, uh, exploitation, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, injustice, in other words, uh, fair and simple. There is a lot of injustice in the world, and these injustices have to be dealt with. So the need of the hour, actually, is creative thinking and a more sensitive and people-friendly globalization greater understanding of uh, people's needs and uh, um, of the particularly of the developing world, greater sensitivity for the marginalized and the minority groups, um, you know, I mean, something, something like uh, what happens uh, within our own country or um, within the other countries. And, you know, I mean, because uh, today's, uh, particularly the developing countries, they're not really one nation uh, countries you know i mean there are uh, there are many ethnicities there are many there they are pluralistic societies and uh, not ho homogeneous societies so therefore uh, there, there there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of discord within these countries and they have to be 
dealt with by means of better governance. Uh, so counter terror is not always the right answer. Counter terror, of course, has to be uh, adopted. So there has to be the right mix of both counter terror measures on the one hand, as well as, of course, you know, I mean, a sensitive understanding of why such terror actually is taking place. And uh, it must be understood that, you know, more force breeds greater terror. So finally, uh, I uh, conclude with uh, four suggestions. Firstly, of course, you know, I mean, uh, we have to deal with religious radicalism. And this religious radicalization is taking place on a mass scale. And it is necessary to uh, try and understand why young people actually are uh, prepared to commit suicide for the cause of their own religion. But it is, a mis it is, it is actually a misperceived uh, under understanding of religion. And uh, that should be actually driven home to them. Secondly, there has to be a solution to the injustices that I was talking about earlier, particularly something like, say, uh, uh, Palestine. Thirdly, uh, there has to be uh, stepped up uh, security. That is, uh, in other words, you know, we know that uh, we are all fighting an invisible force. And so, therefore, we have to be better prepared. And uh, all kinds of guidelines are being laid down by the experts to, uh, you know, I mean, to deal with this situation, particularly uh, intelligence sharing. And finally, of course, you know, I mean, of course, this is easier said than done. And it's a long term proposition. I mean, what is necessary actually is a more just and fairer world order where there is, uh, of course, you know, it is not possible to hope for an absolutely uh, a just world and a fair world that there will be inequalities, there will be uh, inequities, but they should be brought down, they should be minimized as much as possible. Un until and unless we are able to achieve that, uh, I don't think the menace of terrorism actually will go away from us. Thank you.